منها بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ات از ماي بليجر اون اونر تو هاف بروفيسور ابراهيم سعيد ويز اس ذس نايت بروفيسور ابراهيم سعيد اي ام جوين تو بريزنت هيم ان عربيك علشان علشان اخد راحتي بقى في الكلام هو طبعا استاذ دكتور ابراهيم سعيد انا فعلا سعدت جدا 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 لمده شهرين لما انضميت وكانت فرصه سعيده جدا ان استاذنا الدكتور فهد المهنا دعاني بعد ما زار المنصوره هنا قبلها بسنه فطبعا الدكتور ابراهيم سعيد انا اتعرفت على انسان غالي القيمه دكتور ابراهيم مواليد 51 بني سويف وكان ده من اعياد الميلاد بتاع دكتور ابراهيم طبعا دكتور ابراهيم ديت الدرجات العلميه بدات بكالوريوس سنه 74 ماجستير بطنه 78 في مصر وبعدين دكتوراه في جامعه القاهره 83 دكتوراه في الكلى من استراليا في 87 وارب بورد 89 وطبعا حاليا الدكتور ابراهيم بيشغل وظيفه استاذ في جامعه الامام عبد الرحمن بن فيصل كان اسمها جامعه الدمام سابقا طبعا قبل كده تدرج عشان يوصل لاستاذ طبعا مشى في السلك من اول تشيف ريزيدنت في اول الثمانينات لغايه ما بقى استاذ في الجامعه وطبعا كل الناس اللي هناك بتعشق الدكتور ابراهيم مش الاطباء بس الاطباء والتمريض لانه بجانب الاكاديميك كارير الدكتور ابراهيم نشر اكثر من 85 مقاله وطبعا هو عضو في جميع السوسايتيز الخاصه بالكلى سواء السعودي سواء الاوروبي سواء الامريكان سواء في نفرولوجي فطبعا ده جميل جدا انا في دقيقتين كمان هعرض بعض الصور اللي انا بعتز بها جدا لان انا لما استاذنا الدكتور فهد المهنا وكان في الوقت ده هو النائب الاول لرئيس جامعه الامام عبد الرحمن بن فيصل لمست فيه انسانيه عاليه جدا وبعدين لما وصلت هناك لقيت الدكتور ابراهيم بحاجة ما شاء الله يعني قمة الحنان والحب والعطاء طبعا دكتور تامر زميلنا فطبعا ده كان في مكتب الدكتور فهد وان شاء الله دايما في تحاب وتعاون لانه طبعا احنا الارواح طلاقت لانه ناس عالية جدا طبعا دكتور عبد الله الهويش رئيس وحدة الكلى في ال جامعة الإمام عبد الرحمن فيصل وطبعا راجل ما يعني له عطاء كبير جدا وأبحاث في تطوير الغسيل البريتوني وأنا لمست فيه الجدية في العمل ودي صورة في وحدة الكلى كلها في طبعا الدكتور إبراهيم وكان الدكتور سمير موجود ما أعرفش موجود ولا ريتايرد لكن والدكتور عبد الله الهويش وكل فريق وحدة الكلى والدكتور فهد برضه والدكتور تامر والدكتور محمد طبعا مجموعه كبيره جدا من الناس اللي الواحد بيعتز بمعرفتهم دكتور ابراهيم دايما في القلب لانه السهل الممتنع العطاء الذي يعني لا ينضب وطبعا في الميتنجز فيري سمارت ان ديسكاسنج ذا كيسز دايما بنتعلم من تعليقاته ويمكن دي كان في عمليه التعليم الالكتروني اللي اعتقد الدكتور ابراهيم قاعد فيه دلوقتي انه لابد الواحد يستخدم حاجات كثيره قوي من الكلام والتفاعل والاستماع والنظر ما يبقاش ثابت على وتيره واحده ويمكن احنا هناك عملنا بدانا نشاط كويس في عمليه التعليم الالكتروني بالكلاب اللي تم في الفندق ثم تلاه مناقشات كانت عن اخلاقيات زراعه الكلى في العماده والدكتور ابراهيم كل الناس بتحتفي بيه وتولد عن الزياره الوقت كولابوريشن مع جامعه المنصوره مع جامعه الامام عبد الرحمن بن فيصل عندنا اثنين من خيره الدكاتره اللي شغالين في الجامعه مع الدكتور ابراهيم طبعا الدكتور تامر السلمون والدكتور هاني منصور الاثنين مسجلين دكتوراه في طب المنصور. The topic of sickle cell disease it is very interesting and although our experience in uh, in sickle cell is very humble but we faced the problem uh, since 18 years 2002 when we uh, when we have a patient who insisted uh, to be transplanted. So sickle cell disease in the stage kidney disease on dialysis, and she insisted uh, to be transplanted. We, we asked at that time all the experts in the Mediscape and everywhere, and we didn't find a good help to prepare this case. So uh, we established a core 
to uh, settle an algorithm to proceed. And we succeeded to reduce hemoglobin S uh, to the its nadir, and then uh, transplantation was carried out, followed by a success journey of uh, uh, 11 years. And this uh, lady uh, was married and had a very nice girl, and the graft worked for 11 years. So uh, today I'm, I, I am eager to hear and to uh, uh, learn from Professor Ibrahim Saeed about sickle cell, sickle cell disease and its affection of the kidney. Um, before uh, I leave the mic to Professor Ibrahim Saeed, uh, Professor Ibrahim Saeed insisted to put this photo in the announcement, including me and Dr. Tamer. And this reflects how he is a human, how he is sincere. Uh, I love uh, Professor Ibrahim Saeed too much, and I'm sure that uh, he will uh, uh, leave an experience to all of us. Thank you, Professor Ibrahim, and we are waiting your presentation. I'm going to stop my slides, and please start your chair. Thank you, Dr. Hussein. Uh, Professor Hussein, I really appreciate all what you have said, and actually I don't deserve all that. Uh, and uh, I will never forget that you are the one who started the uh, e-learning in our university, because before that it was not uh, our one of the options we have. And now it proved during the era of uh, uh, Corona, that it, 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 is, it is very, very uh, useful. Uh, now, as you know, we are uh, uh, presenting uh, all our lectures to the students online uh, through that uh, uh, the e-learning. And uh, not only that, but we learn from you that we can use it for clinical teaching, uh, like we put simulators or dummies or whatever. Uh, we can uh, have even oral exam. Uh, you, you cannot uh, uh, imagine how much we got uh, from your help, and uh, God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor I Brian. I'll start uh, my talk uh, with this uh, picture. Please and, open uh, the slide. Open the slide, Professor Brian. Uh, Make it show. Slide show, open slide show. Slide show. You opened the door, Ibrahim? Yes. You opened it, minimization, you opened it, minimization. And on the share screen, you can open the share screen, the one that's under the door, and you open it from the shared window. Okay. You can open the first minimization, you open it, open, minimize. واضغط على البتاع الخضراء اللي هي تشير سكرين وافتح من خلالها اول ما تلاقي اعمل على دبل كليك هتفتح عندنا. شايف الاخضر اللي هو التشير سكرين اللي تحت ده؟ هو هو فوق هنا دكتور هنا ماشي اضغط على التشير سكرين الاخضر Make your chair. Yeah. Okay. ومن خلال الشير اضغط على السلايد بتاعتك. دبل كليك. Yes. Yes. Now it is okay. It appears now. It appears well. Yes. Okay. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي. اللهم ثبتنا بالقول الثابت في الحياه الدنيا وفي الاخره. Uh, first of all, sickle cell disease, unfortunately, in our area, that is the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, is becoming a national problem. Uh, almost uh, like 75% uh, of people in Al Qatif and uh, the areas around, uh, they suffer from either sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait. We have also the same problem in a region which is called Al Hasa. And uh, 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 I want to give an introduction first because uh, before 
discussing the renal complications and the renal manifestation of sickle cell disease. I just want to share with you some of the important points in the introduction. The first one who described sickle cell disease was a man named Robert Herrick. This was in 1910. Uh, when he described peculiar and sickle-shaped RBCs in case of severe anemia. Before that time, the uh, sickle cell disease was not known. He described a young black Canadian dental student had painful crisis and unusual poikilocytosis. That student, he lived until the age of 32, and then he died because of pneumonia. This was followed by a striker in 1923, and in the Medical College of Georgia, uh, uh, he performed the first uh, autopsy on uh, uh, some uh, sickle cell patient who died because of complication. And uh, his report was on growth and microscopic renal uh, abnormalities. Uh, he found the light microscopic changes very funny. He described glomeruli, which were distended with funny abnormal RBCs. Later on, they called it sickle. And uh, he described also sustainable iron in the renal tubular cells. Uh, and then uh, Lymus, uh, 1949, he started to dig in the structure of the RBCs, which are abnormal. And he found that the abnormal uh, hemoglobin, uh, uh, he called, he, he didn't uh, give him a name, but he described that hemoglobin is abnormal, electrophoretically. And then Harris came in 1950, and he found that this hemoglobin, which is abnormal, is less soluble, and it has tendency to gelation. Singer and Singer, 1953, and that's why they call the disease SS disease because of those people. He showed that the uh, abnormal hemoglobin caused some problems, and uh, this problem can be minimized by the presence of high concentration of fetal hemoglobin, which is hemoglobin F. This was followed by Ingram, 1956. He uh, uh, described the real abnormality and the cause of this abnormality hemoglobin. He uh, found that there is a uh, uh, some uh, transposition of uh, uh, valine with uh, arginine in the sixth position of the uh, beta chain of the hemoglobin. And uh, uh, he found that this one is transmitted uh, or inherited uh, via uh, some autosomal recessive pattern. Initially, they thought that it is a mutation, but later on, they described it as after they uh, studied the families, they described it as autosomal recessive. This was a slide of the blood of the first case, which I described in the beginning, the young black uh, Canadian who died later on at the age of 35 because of pneumonia. And this was his blood film showing the abnormal cells, which are very clear here. They called it sickle cell because of its shape. Later on, after that, uh, the uh, researchers found other hemoglobin variant related to the uh, sickle uh, hemoglobin or SS. And they found that it is not only the hemoglobin SS, there is hemoglobin SC, there is SD, there is SA, there is SO Arab, it's called SO Arab. And this collectively, they call it hybrid uh, sickling disorders. And uh, then I have to tell you that the disease is not only in our area, uh, it covers uh, other places, it's worldwide. As you can see from this map, it's present in Africa, uh, uh, middle and in the north of Africa, some areas of uh, Europe near the Mediterranean Sea. Of course, as I said, in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia and uh, some uh, Indian uh, territories. And I think we have to add to, add to that that uh, there is a great proportion of the African-American uh, citizen that they have also sickle cell. Of course, the sickle cell is different. Uh, uh, in the, our area, it's called Indian type. Indian type, uh, which is to some extent milder than what's seen in the African-American, the black people, they call it African type. The mortality in African type is much more. Morbidity is worse. Uh, the Indian type here 
has a better prognosis. What is the positive physiology behind that? As I said, uh, there is uh, a transposition of the uh, uh, baleen with the uh, glutamic acid in the beta chain of hemoglobin, uh, the globin part of hemoglobin. And the normal condition when there is no uh, deoxygenation and no stress, uh, no infection, etc. The cells in the sickle uh, disease patients, they appear normal like that. Of course, uh, they have anemia, chronic anemia, but the shape of the cell is more or less uh, like normal. Once they are exposed to stressful situation, they get deoxygenated and then they become arranged close to each other like that and causing a lot of problems. They take funny shape and then sickle. Once it becomes sickle, they secrete or release cytokines. They damage the endothelium. They activate the coagulation cascade and they also activate platelet aggregation. And then the result of the occlusion of the blood vessels. Uh, hemoglobin S, of course, uh, as I said, has problems. Uh, uh, this Mohandas and Ballas in 1940, uh, they uh, assumed that uh, the hazardous effects or the bad effects of the hemoglobin is, is because it changes the RBCs, become more rigid and more sticky. And they can revert to normal if you remove the stimulus. But however, we have to remember that sometimes especially with chronic disease, and especially in all the other, uh, you may get irreversible changes. And these irreversible sickle cells, you call it dense cells. These dense cells may stay in the bloodstream for a long time, causing problems. Uh, the severity of hemolytic anemia is proportional to the number of these dense cells. That is the normal uh, hemoglobin molecule, the normal cell. But in the uh, second, under the stress, they will take uh, a shape like chain. And that's why the RBCs will take the shape of the hemoglobin molecules. Now, this slide is taken again from one of the patients uh, which uh, have been published by Mohandas and Wallace. Uh, these are cells more or less normal. This is electron microscopy. And these cells, once you remove the uh, stimulus, or the uh, factor which uh, causes the cycling, they uh, go back to normal. The problem that if the uh, stimulus is prolonged or like infection, for example, for a long time, or patient dehydrated and not treated for a long time, or other stressful situation, then the cells remain abnormal, and these are called the dense cells. According to the concentration of the dense cell, the severity of uh, sickle cell disease is uh, presenting itself. Now, uh, when these dense cells are present in large number, they can reduce this oxygenation, they increase the blood viscosity because of their abnormal shape and uh, tendency to stick to the endothelium. Uh, they uh, can affect the vessels, causing thrombi and infarction. The vaso occlusion is uh, actually uh, the main problem which happened those people, it is not seen in other hemolytic disease, for example, thalassemia or autoimmune hemolytic anemia, etc. Uh, there is here buzz occlusion, and I will explain why. It is uh, uh, affected by the concentration of the dense cell, the activation of coagulation cascade, the platelet activation, and the vascular tone and the endothelial. Here, uh, this uh, picture may explain what I have said just now. These cells contain the SS hemoglobin. Once they are exposed to stressful situation uh, like dehydration or infection, they undergo gelation and then sickling and then hemolysis. Meanwhile, they activate the uh, coagulation cascade. And at the same time, they stimulate the production of inflammatory stimuli like endothelin one and cytokines, etc. They activate the platelets and this leads to uh, adhesion to the endothelium and sometimes destruction of the endothelium of the blood vessels and hence facilitating the process of occlusion. So once you get the uh, damage which I explained before, with time, 
uh, you'll get intimal hyperplasia of blood vessel. Again, with time, you get vasospasm. And the longer the vasospasm, the more tendency to develop vascular occlusion. And uh, vascular occlusion will lead to ischemia. Ischemia, if it is prolonged, may cause fibrosis and tissue damage and major organ failure. So uh, at the end, you will get a picture like this. Sickle inside, uh, activated WBC, platelet activation, uh, and the narrowing of the blood vessel in different places, causing vasoclusion. Now, it is not only the vasoclusive crisis which disturbs uh, those people, poor people. They have other types of crises. They may have acute hemolytic crisis, accelerated hemolysis, and uh, in this condition, you uh, uh, patient doesn't suffer vaso occlusion, but severe anemia. So when he present, he present with the picture, classical picture of hemolytic anemia, that is uh, uh, severe anemia and joints. And a plastic crisis when uh, depression of the bone marrow occurs and the reduction of the number of reticulocytes, and this usually occurs as a reaction to some infections and the most famous infection which cause bone marrow uh, inhibition or is called aplasia is the parovirus B19. And we have the sequestration crisis. What is the meaning of the word sequestration? It's strapping in some organ. And the organ here is the spleen. And uh, the spleen become enlarged because it engulfs about one third of the circulation. So stretching of the capsule the spleen may reach even 10 times its normal size, become very painful. A patient may be shocked because a significant portion of circulation is trapped inside the spleen. We call it sequestration. In addition to that, patient may get bone marrow necrosis because of different factors. Now, that is the sequence of events when a patient gets a vasoclusive crisis. First, uh, that is a uh, patient before, and then once crisis occurs, Almost uh, all these cells become sickled, or, uh, almost all. And this by day seven, the number of sickle cells will be less. And uh, by 12, day 12 to 14, they turn to normal, provided that the uh, uh, factor or the, uh, which initiated the sickling is removed. What is the frequency of major organ failure in sickle cell anemia? This is a study which is published by Paz and his colleague. On the left here, you get the percentage of patients with symptomatic chronic organ failure, and here are the different ones. I have to say that without looking at this uh, graph, I have to tell you, and I am sure you know that, sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia can uh, damage any organ in the body. Brain, heart, spleen, liver, uh, retina, uh, bones, musculoskeletal, and also kidney. And uh, in this study, the total number was 785. And out of those 785, they got 33 with chronic kidney disease. Now I'm talking about chronic kidney disease. But uh, uh, this slide doesn't represent other kidney problems like proteinuria, glomerular disease, tubular interstitial, papillary necrosis, etc., which I'm going to discuss. But just to draw your attention to the uh, significance of uh, kidney involvement. What happened uh, regarding glomerular filtration and renal blood flow? Several studies proved beyond doubt that in young patients, this increase in the plasma flow, in the blood flow, in glomerular filtration, it increased significantly, remarkably, up to 50% sometimes. This was published a long time ago and published recently by Levin in 2019. So initially in the young, I mean young children and uh, young adults, adolescents, for example, they have increased in the blood flow in the glomerulification rate. And they try to explain why they have the increase in plasma flow. So some people, they attributed it to the anemia itself. And they have proof, for example, Brooke in 1990, he found that there is uh, 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 these abnormalities which increase glomerular filtration rate, plasma flow, etc. It's found also in people with beta thalassemia. They are not secular, but beta thalassemia. So he assumed that anemia may be responsible. 
However, of course, now we know that there are other factors because those people in 1914, in 2014, they tried to uh, abolish the hyperfiltration and increase plasma flow by blood transfusion. But they found that even with blood transfusion, these renal abnormalities, increased blood flow, plasma flow, was not corrected. So it is not only anemia, there should be some other factors. And this hyperfiltration, another point, another proof that anemia is not the only factor responsible for the Gourmet hyperfiltration, that this hyperfiltration phenomena exists only in the children and very young adults, but once they grow old, it disappears. And they go to reduce blood flow and a lot of kidney problems. So it is not anemia alone. There should be other factors. This renal hemodynamics, which I mentioned just now, uh, will affect not only the glomeruli, affect tubular function, blood pressure regulation, and uh, the uh, authors uh, in uh, uh, recently, 2014-2017, as you can see here, well-designed studies, uh, they found a significant proportion of those people, they develop a, a chronic hyperfiltration glomerulopathy, uh, similar to some extent to the what happens in diabetic patients. And uh, 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 these studies uh, try to link the uh, vasodilator prostaglandin with the increased uh, blood flow. However, they fail. Till now, till now, till the present time, there is a lot of debate about the role of prostaglandin with the vasodilator or vasoconstrictor. All what I can say that those two publishers and their colleagues we could prove only that there is increased excretion of the vasoconstrictor prostaglandin metabolite. But they could not prove beyond doubt that there is increase in the vasodilator prostaglandin. So then maybe uh, uh, the decreased excretion of vasoconstrictor, it may play out. However, we cannot simply say that it is the uh, mere uh, vasodilator prostaglandin alone or the vasoconstrictor. It is actually the ratio of and this was shown clearly uh, by Nike and Alka in 2014-2017. You can go to and uh, 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 go through these, uh, these articles. They are very nice. The glomerular abnormalities in young patients include the following: glomerular enlargement by about 50 percent because of glomerular hyperfiltration. There will be increased number of the capillary lumina. There is increase in the all cells inside endothelial, mesothelial, mesangia, etc. There will be congestion of the gourmet capillaries with sickled RBCs, in addition to some changes in the tubule in the form of hemocytidine deposition. Uh, so, this is one of their cases. Uh, it's showing here clearly the following. Number one, the glomerulus is enlarged. This is not the usual size of a glomerulus. Number two, market increase in cellularity. And uh, of course, we cannot judge by light microscopy, but at least we can say that increased cellularity. Probably it is a combination of mesangial as well as uh, epithelial and epithelial cells together. Um, and this one was in the same publication in 2017 which is uh, by John Silverstein to show the uh, severe uh, market, <coughs> enormous deposition of hemocytidine in the renal tubule. I have to remember this when we come to discuss the tubular abnormality. One of the factors that uh, damages and affect the tubules is the uh, uh, severe deposition of hemocytidine in proximal distal as well as loop of N. And I think it's clear here in this slide that is uh, high magnification, that the sickle cell are present inside the glomerular capillaries, and these brownish uh, spots here uh, in the tubule are nothing but hemocytidine deposition. This is electron microscopy from uh, uh, one of the publications which I mentioned before, and it's showing here the distinction of the glomerular capillaries with the sickle cells. Uh, whether or not it's showing increase or um, expansion of mesangium, it is not uh, very clear here, but maybe clear in uh, other slides. 
However, uh, this changes that a enlargement of the glomeruli with this, uh, increasing number of cells, uh, number of capillary lumina, deposition of uh, hemosiderin and iron tubules. It is not unique for uh, uh, sickle cell anemia because uh, some uh, authors found it in cyanotical disease, morbid obesity, sleep apnea, and other conditions. Uh, and all uh, these cases, the explanation was the kidney is subjected to increased blood viscosity and local ischemia. So these are all compensatory mechanisms, in addition to the position of iron, of course. What about the tubular function? We have proximal and distal convoluted tubules. And the proximal to, uh, convoluted tubule, because of the high gonification rate, the high blood flow and plasma flow, there will be enhancement of the proximal renal tubular function. The, uh, it will reflect itself as increased excretion of creatinine. And uh, this will uh, be increased by about 25%. And that's why initially in those children and uh, young adults, in spite of the changes which occur in the glomeruli, we uh, don't be surprised to find normal renal function because creatinine uh, excretion is increased. However, this time, when those people get old, it starts to decrease. And uh, what about uric acid? Uric acid clearance is enhanced in those people. And so remember this very important, no hyperuricemia in those people, in spite of the fact that this is a hemolytic disease. And we know that most of the hemolytic diseases are associated with hyperuricemia. So why there is no hyperuricemia in sickle cell anemia because of increased glomerular fetation to the inner blood flow, enhancement of the uh, proximal tubular reabsorption, uh, sorry, proximal tubular excretion of uric acid. Uh, once uh, you get increase in uric acid in a secular patient, be sure that his kidney is damaged on chronic basis. Uh, again, because of enhancement of the proximal tubular function, there will be enhancement of reabsorption of sodium and phosphor. So a question here, what is the explanation of the hyperphosphatemia and people who are secular, why the kidney function is normal? The explanation is that there is increased reabsorption of phosphorus and sodium by the proximal convoluted tubule. So let me summarize these three important facts. Fact number one, that initially young children and young adults there is no elevation of creatinine in spite of the damage which occurs in the glomeruli because of the hyperfiltration and the enhancement of proximal tubular function with enhancement of creatinine secretion. Fact number two, no hyperuricemia in young children and young adults because of the same reason. And to the extent that if you find persistent hyperuricemia in those people, be sure that the tubular function now is permanently damaged or affected. Hyperphosphatemia in children and young adults associated with sickle cell anemia, but with normal kidney function is expected and does not want special management unless it's reach high level. Expected because again of enhancement of proximal tubular reabsorption of sodium and now move to the distal uh, convolute tubule abnormality. Uh, remember that the earliest renal abnormality in all the kidney in the cyclas is the loss of concentration ability. They cannot produce concentrated urine because the distal tubular function of concentration is impaired. By the time they reach young adults, they cannot concentrate urine to values of 500 milliliters mol per kg or more. And this is published already by Sylvia, by Silva and his colleagues. In young children, remember, in young children uh, and uh, young adults, transfusion of blood may, may, it is not definite, restore the concentration ability. This was discovered a long time ago. 
Now, this is another fact, that if you transfuse a patient who is sicker and still he cannot or she cannot regain concentration ability, be sure that the vasa recta is affected and the kidney changes are chronic. So I have here two important facts to remind you with. Number one, the hyperuricemia, not expected in uh, sickler of young or adolescent. Once this persists a hyperuricemia, then uh, uh, start to think of a chronic permanent disease damage of the kidney. Number two, if in spite of blood transfusion, there is no restoration of the distal tubal function to concentrate urine, this means that irreversible changes happen. Irreversible. And usually is seen in advanced age. Advanced age, I don't mean 60s or 70s, because those people, they don't live that much. Now, this illustrates the problem of uh, lack of concentration of urine. Why? The function of concentration of urine actually uh, uh, is the property of the inner medulla. Because the inner medulla contains the long loops of fingers. That is normal. Outer medulla, inner medulla. The function of concentration of urine is related to the inner medulla. In sickle cell trait, even trait, we found, and uh, other people, they found that they can still concentrate urine well, even up to age of 70. Then after that, they lose the inner medal. But in sickle cell anemia, only up to 15 years, the changes are reversible. But over 15 years, over 15 years, this uh, uh, function, which is the urine concentration, is lost. Why is that? Because we lose the inner medulla by this age. So, again, what is the earliest uh, sign in those people uh, related to kidney? The earliest renal abnormality in sickle cell disease patient is lack of ability to concentrate here. Usually asymptomatic, but they may come with aneurysis, aneurysis in childhood. And uh, uh, sometimes it is risky and serious because it may lead to inability to defend the body water under certain conditions like extreme heat uh, or fluid deprivation or when they lose fluid. Because they cannot concentrate when they cannot reserve fluid inside the body. So they are liable to develop hypovolemic shock under this stressful situation. Now, this uh, maybe need further explanation here. And this uh, figure, shows the vasa recta, descending and ascending limbs, and this is the inner medulla, which is outside. Now, the development of medullary hypoxia, because I said that the problem is in the inner medulla, there is medullary hypoxia. It is due to exchange of oxygen between the descending and ascending limbs of vasa recta, these are the straight arrow, straight arrow. Again, development of medullary hypoxia is due to exchange of oxygen between the descending and the ascending vasa recta and to oxygen consumption by the medullary cells. These are the curved arrows. At the end, you get partial pressure of oxygen, which is five to 10 uh, uh, millimeters mercury, less than normal. This hypoxia, or relative hypoxia of the inner medulla, they thought that it is responsible for the inability to concentrate urine, till now. Now, uh, they have also impaired ability to, uh, for, uh, I mean disturbed acidification and potassium excretion. Uh, many of them, they have incomplete distal reantubular acidosis. 1968, Hocking and colleague, they reported eight cyclers with abnormal urine pH, and they don't respond to ammonium chloride loading. They say they cannot uh, drop the urine pH below 
5.5. And this was followed by Oster et al. 1976. He found similar defect in six out of 20 of the hemoglobin SS patients. What is the difference between that and the classical renal tuberous? They don't have classical renal tuberous. The differences are number one, acidemia, not acidosis, acidemia is rare, unless, of course, they uh, reduce the gomification rate to serious levels. They don't have hypokalemia, I'll explain why. They don't have hypercalcuria, they don't develop nephrocalcinosis. So, again, the four differences between the distal arena to acidosis in secular and the classical one is that they have uh, this uh, rare acidemia, they don't develop hypokalemia, they do not have hypercalcuria, and there is no nephrocalcinosis. Usually, that tubular abnormality, which I mentioned, usually in early age, uh, it is subclinical and requires no specific treatment. But if they develop hyperuricemia later on, then you treat them as usual, like any patient with hyperuricemia. If they develop acidosis because of the incomplete renal tubular acidosis, they may need alkali therapy and modification of it. Uh, sometimes, if uh, the uh, glomerulation rate is low, you may need to add potassium binding resins and phosphate binders and get help by low risk also and It depends on the situation. I mean, you have to personalize uh, the case. These are not the treatment for every secular patient who develop uh, uh, tubular abnormality. It depends on the levels of potassium and phosphorus, degree of acidosis, and the condition in general. However, one point here, because we'll come to it later on when we discuss polyphenolia, that when uh, uh, Patient develop proteinuria uh, with sickle. Sometimes AC inhibitor or uh, AC receptor blocker may be needed. If you need it or if you use it, use it with caution because those people are liable to develop hyperkalemia. Again, non steroidal anti inflammatory with caution. And do they need non steroidal anti inflammatory? Of course, those people in vasoclus crisis, and I'm sure all of you have seen this, are shouting, they are crying of pain. And uh, there is no other solution. Morphine, you cannot keep them on morphine forever. And then after the attack, they still need non steroidal anti inflammatory. They are consumers of non steroidal anti inflammatory. So use it with caution. Even if you need heparin because some clotting here and there, with caution because we know also heparin may be associated with hyperkalemia. No place, of course, for potassium sparing therapies. And then be aware of the recently recognized ability of the trimethoprim and pentamidine to display amyloid-like effect on the distal potassium secretion, so they may develop hyperkalemia if you use such types of drugs. Now move to hematuria. Let us start from here. The RVCs are sickled under stressful situation, dehydration, infection, etc. Once they sickle, they clog to the basal wall and endothelium, activate platelet aggregation and coagulation uh, cascade and increase blood viscosity. And because of that, microsombi develop. Microsombi will have some bad effect in the blood vessel and on the tissues, leading to tissue hypoxia. Hypoxia can lead to local acidosis and local acidosis in the kidney, I mean, in the medulla, will uh, add another burden and you get more sickling, sickling, blood viscosity, microsome by. It is a vicious circle. Once they develop the microsome by, of course, there will be decreased medullary blood flow and there will be impairment of concentration and the hypocenuria. But the most serious is the occlusion of the vasa recta. If they occlude the vasa recta, then they get hematuria or papillary necrosis or both. So that's actually what is the mechanism of the hypocenuria, hematuria, and papillary necrosis in this case. This hematuria usually is microscopic. But however, it may be interrupted by bouts of gross hematuria. And what is the cause of that microsombotic infarction and extravasation of blood in the anal medulla and the papilla? 
because of the uh, unfavorable atmosphere of the medulla. Medulla, as I mentioned, there is a relative hypoxia, hypertonicity, and it is acidic medium. If it complicated by complete obliteration of basal recta by this sickle cell, the enchanting of blood through pelvic capillaries as a compensation, and then subsequent extravasation of blood into the collecting system and hematuria will occur. The loss hematuria, now uh, uh, these are debates, well, points of debates. By the way, I said to many of the articles, they don't give uh, uh, convincing uh, facts or some good explanation for why it is more common in male than female. I wish that if any one of you gentlemen and ladies, I, uh, if you have answers for that. And the why left kidney, I, yeah, I read maybe uh, five, six, seven explanations, but there's no proof for that. Blood loss sometimes may be severe and they require blood control. So these one, two, three lines are considered as complication of hematuria. There is complication that it may require blood transfusion sometimes. I have seen patients with uh, severe hematuria who require blood transfusion. Again, clotting may occur in the urinary collecting system. It may be large enough to obstruct the urinary tract and give more complication with uh, obstructive uropathy. And uh, because you know the blood, of course, uh, is not only RBCs, are white cells also. So when blood appears in the urine, there will be plenty of these white cells and misdiagnosed sometimes as uh, pyelonephritis or urinary tract infection. So be aware of this so that you don't misdiagnose. <clears throat> how to treat, how to deal with. I found myself that most of the cases which present with microscopic hematuria, they don't need uh, treatment. But if it is massive, if it is gross hematuria, Sometimes you may need to infuse them with bicarbonate and uh, normal saline or even dextrose. And uh, you may need diuretics, hyperbaric oxygen. Some authors are with giving amino, uh, epsilon amino caprolic acid. Uh, I'm sure you know we give this drug for severe bleeding because it leads to coagulation. But others are against, like black, for example. Black 1996, and I think many others, they don't encourage the use of uh, epsilon amino caprolic acid, uh, caprolic acid because uh, almost uh, all cases are complicated by clotting and the clotting may overstep the urine. Sometimes you may need to pesticide the blood to avoid clotting. Papillary necrosis, the first one who recognized the association between sickle cell anemia and renal papillary necrosis was Harold and his colleagues in 1963. And he found that it is not only in sickle cell anemia, but also in sickle cell trait and the other hybrid sickle disorders like uh, uh, hemoglobin uh, SC or SD or SO or, S, uh, or SA. It's called hybrid sickle disorder. So uh, be aware of this because uh, I found during my work in the last 40 years, that many of us, uh, they tend to neglect the fact that the sickle traits also are liable to complication in the kidney, including the papillary necrosis, so encourage them always to drink plenty of fluid and uh, to come to us report, uh, reporting any uh, loin pain or some form of hematuria. Uh, most of the cases are discovered uh, accidentally when uh, you do uh, intervene spirography or ultrasound. And this is the first case which was described by Hull. And uh, he found during intervene spirography that the uh, area of the pyramid uh, looks abnormal. He couldn't describe it very well, but he said that he noticed sloughing of one of the papillae uh, and some cyst formation near another papillae. And uh, he named it as papillary necrosis. He is the first one who discovered the relation between sickle cell anemia uh, and sickle cell disease in general with the papillary necrosis. Then there was a very nice detailed analysis by Vamondi and his colleagues. They studied 334 sickles. 
and he found it very frequent. It is up to 39%, approximately 40% of them, they have papillary necrosis. 131 out of 334. So it is not a real complication, it is common. And by the way, it is not always associated with pain and acute kidney uh, failure, like uh, some uh, colleagues, my junior colleagues, I mean, they say, how can you diagnose papillary necrosis? A patient doesn't have pain. It is not uh, necessary. Many of them, they don't have pain. And by the way, many of them, they don't have fine hematuria. They present only with uh, microscopic hematuria. And we discovered the papillary necrosis by ultrasound or by other radiological maneuvers. And uh, that's why remember that it is usually painless, painless. Few of them may have pulmonary presentation like renal colic or suction, or even they may develop infection at the slough papillae and may be complicated by sepsis and acute kidney injury. But as I, uh, I, I repeat, this is few, few of them, not many of them. Again, this figure I think I showed before, the occlusion of Bosa recta is responsible for hematuria and papillary necrosis. So it is the cycling of RBCs in the vasa recta, which leads to the medullary infarction and the papillary necrosis. And following that will be exterization of RBCs in the RBCs in the uh, renal perfus. Why is that? It is promoted by the unfavorable medium of the medulla, the triad of hypoxia, hypertonicity, and low pH. This favors sickling in this area and occlusion of the vasa uh, I have encountered two cases during my career, only uh, with papillary necrosis, which progressed to cortical necrosis, and I published them. Bamondi also he categorized uh, papillary necrosis according to severity, and I think till now, till now we are in the year 2020. Still, the classification of Bamondi is bad. He divided papillary necrosis into two main categories, partial and total. The partial, which shows the uh, uh, signal sign, the uh, cyst formation, cavities, sinuses, but there is no sloughing. Once there is sloughing of the papillae, whether it's total here or partial like this one, usually it is associated with cupping. This is called cupping and this is called ring sign. Ring sign is very peculiar with the papillary necrosis which occurs in the uh, type 2, uh, total papillary, type 2, which is total papillary necrosis. So the triad of complete or partial sloughing of papillae with cupping and the ring sign indicates that you are dealing with type 2, which is of course more severe. I think this picture is more clear here and showing the sloughing of the papillae from the kidney with also some cupping you notice in this place. And this one showing the classical ring sign. It's called the ring sign because in the area of papillae it, it looks like ring. And here, almost all papillae we are showing this. And we know from the presence of the ring uh, sign and the sloughing, which I showed before, this is uh, type 2 or the so-called total papillary necrosis. Uh, this one, again, is showing sloughing of one of the papillae in cases of severe papillary necrosis. Now, moving to problem of blood pressure regulation in those people. We know that African-American, they are having uh, hypertension in about 30%. I think this is all well now. But uh, not surprisingly, but it was documented that in those Af African-American seclers, they don't have hypertension. Actually, they get both systolic and systolic below normal. Those seclers, African-American, who are about one third of them, they are usually hypertensive, but if they are secular, they are hypotensive. The blood pressure, uh, not to say hypotensive, 
we can say that, better to say that the systolic and diastolic blood pressure is below normal. And this was described by many authors. We have here Johnson and Georgie. They studied 187 patients sickle, and they found the prevalence of hypertension in those 187 was only 3.2. And the mean blood pressure in all of those sickle was 116 over 7. Again, uh, Grell and the, uh, Dijon, uh, they got similar results. And Sklar, 1994, he stated clearly that hypertension in sicklers indicate that they develop chronic kidney disease. Okay? So, let me repeat. Hyperuricemia in sicklers indicate permanent kidney damage. Okay, and uh, the presence of hypertension in those sicklers indicate chronic kidney disease. Okay, you have to remember that. And this is a study of uh, Johnson and Georgie. Here, this is the blood pressure, men, women. The blue line represents the normal people, not secular, or not normal, let us say non secular The black one represents secular. I can see very clearly that in both men and women, the uh, blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, is much less than the average in the non secular Even up to the age of 60, uh, they get low blood pressure. And the reason that they try to explain it by uh, some mechanisms which I will mention now. In the study of Rogers and his colleague, the blood pressure of sickler was lower than general population, but more or less higher than thalassemia. He called it a relative hypertension. It is not hypertension, of course, because they are not hypertension, but it is higher than beta thalassemia. Okay, and uh, uh, what is obvious from various studies that uh, essential hypertension is rarely observed in sickle cell anemia unless they develop chronic kidney disease or chronic renal failure. What is the explanation now for the low blood pressure in those people? Let me put them all so that you can see them all. First of all, anemia in general, as we know, anemic patients, they have decreased peripheral resistance as a compensatory mechanism to enhance blood flow and enhance and increase uh, the tissue oxygenation. Another explanation is the relative excess of vasodilator, prostaglandins, and to some extent, nitric oxide. Myself, I, didn't, I don't believe that nitric oxide is a... Uh, 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 play a role in those people, and I will tell you why. But that's what uh, was mentioned in the literature. Uh, and when I say I believe, that's not from uh, one or two years. I'm here in the Eastern Province for 40, for zero years. I dealt with thousands of seculars, and we published uh, many uh, uh, reports on them. Yes, we found that the vasodilator prostaglandin is playing a role and the increased excretion of the vasoconstrictor prostaglandin also plays a role but nitric oxide is a different story we'll talk about it later there is some degree of salt wasting also because of increased renal blood flow in young patients and also prostaglandins they have some natriuretic effect and those people they decrease the responses to angiotensin because uh, they develop some form of hypoaldosteronism and because of the changes which occur in the uh, distal convertible and the renal neuron. Because of reduced peripheral resistance, the presence of vasodilator prostaglandin, the salt wasting and increased renal blood flow, the natriuretic effect of prostaglandin, and decreased responsiveness, responsiveness of angiotensin, their blood pressure is lower than uh, the other people who are not sick. 
Now let us move to another point, which is acute kidney injury. I'm surprised really to find that uh, very few uh, publications in the literature about acute kidney injury in uh, sickle cell disease. They are all talking about proteinuria, papillomic growth, maturia, even colonic kidney disease. But when it comes to acute kidney disease, I don't know what is the reason. But let me tell you that those people are very susceptible to acute kidney injury because they have tendency to infection. They have always volume depletion. When they get the pain, they don't drink, they don't eat, and they sweat a lot. And they, off, they are taking a lot of these nephrotoxins, which are either uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory or uh, nephrotoxic antibiotics or both. So surprisingly, that a lot of uh, uh, publication on the chronic, but not in acute. Uh, the first reported case on acute kidney injury in a sickler was by Jones in 1970, but he attributed it to rhabdomyolysis. Again, I'm telling you that, okay, he is correct, but nowadays we found other issues. It was followed by Clark and Marvin. He definitely found that there is a risk in the black people uh, with sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease during the vasoclus crisis to get rhabdomyolysis. And again, uh, his group attributed the acute kidney injury to the development of rhabdomyolysis. Now, 1985, the Bureau and the Knowledge, they were the first to report the so-called, they called it non-traumatic rhabdomyolysis during sickle cell crisis. And then subsequent reports supported uh, his publication and they keep the terminology non-traumatic rhabdomyolysis uh, during the acute kidney uh, disease, uh, injury uh, as a complication of the uh, sickle crisis. Again, here you can find the publication you can uh, refer to. Some of them are old, but others here are new, like the one by Yoruba and uh, Zhu and JC and Hajiri. 1918, if you want to refer to it, uh, to find uh, uh, what is rhabdomyolysis in association with sickle cell crisis and other types. Now, this is the first group that is Clark and his colleagues. He said that no, it is not only rhabdomyolysis. Uh, he studied 12, uh, sorry, studied 116 sickle patients. 12 of them had acute crisis uh, ending by acute kidney injury. And the reason for that was the volume depletion and was not the rhabdomyolysis. Uh, so it was the most common cause according to them. Few of them required dialysis, most of them recovered. So I can say yes, rhabdomyolysis, uh, as we know, uh, is a main reason for uh, acute kidney injury during the vasoclusive crisis. But keep in mind also that those people are volume depleted and there is sepsis also and they are taking a lot of nephrotoxic drugs. So Try to be broad mind and think of other causes other than rhabdomyolysis. I'm not saying that uh, neglect rhabdomyolysis as a cause, but uh, widen your differential diagnosis. Now we move to proteinuria and nephrotic syndrome. Uh, what is the time now? Nine seconds. Okay. The first report dealing with the prevalence of proteinuria and sickle cell anemia was, was uh, Henderson 1950. And he reported a prevalence of proteinuria 31% of the sickle he dealt with. Then uh, McCall in 1978, prevalence 15%. Then Sklar 1990, the prevalence was 21%. Then Polk 1992, 26%. Wakefall 1994, 10%, etc. Et Until we come recently here, we have Marzenic and his colleague, and he published in Nephrology Diet Transplantation in the year 2008, and NUS, he published in Kidney International in 2006, and uh, they agreed on a uh, prevalence of 21 to 27 percent. That is to say, up to 27 percent, up to 30 percent in some publications, of this they have to do. In all of these studies, the increase in the proteinuria was associated with increase in the serum creatinine. So they linked the 
proteinuria with deterioration of kidney function. More proteins means that kidney function is worse. What is the pathological finding behind uh, that proteinuria in this uh, uh, publication over 20 years till recently? They attributed to focal segmental gonadal sclerosis, membranoparesis gonophytis. Some of them they found membranous, and the other they described a picture like post infectious gonadotropin. Well, that's okay. All of us know that. But remember this. There are facts here. Fact number one, that there is no immune complex deposition. And uh, that's how it differs from the focal segment and brain membranes, etc., which is due to immune-mediated process, non-secular. No immune complex here by either immunofluorescence or by electron microscopy. And this is not only in sickle cell anemia, but in sickle cell trait and in uh, the other uh, sickle hybrid. Fact number two, that renal vein thrombosis is rarely found and was rarely reported. Fact number three, which is very important, don't, please, don't give steroids to those people. Don't give steroids even with heavy proteinuria and sequence. After biopsy, of course, because you have to rule out that uh, other uh, autoimmune disease are there. We have encountered here people who are sicklers, but with some other autoimmune disease, like systemic lupus or so. So after biopsy, after you make sure that there is no uh, autoimmune disease, it is not immune mediated, the steroids are useless. And those people are having tendency to bone infarction and necrosis. Giving the steroids will just aggravate the problem. And myself, I think it is. Uh, uh, mismatch. So three facts here. Fact number one, no immune complex. Fact number two, the renal vein thrombosis is rare. Fact number three, don't give steroid because they will not respond to steroid. And all authors over 20 years, they agreed on these three facts, which I made. Now this is one of the cyclers who have membrane proliferative. As you can observe here, the thickening of the glomerular uh, capillary basement membrane, and there is mesangial expansion and mesangial cell proliferation. And uh, this is a, an electron microscopy of one of the cyclers. Now notice the following. Number one, that the uh, glomerular capillary uh, is full of sickle cells. Number two, that the endothelial cells are destroyed. Number three, that is mesangial expansion. Number four is more important than all of that. No immune deposition here. No sub-epithelial immune complex deposition. No sub-endothelial immune complex deposition. So the proteinuria here is non-immune mediated. After taking the biopsy, making sure that it is not one of the immune diseases. Uh, uh, so remember the fact that no immune complex, and they will not respond to any immunosuppressive agent at all. You will get complications without benefit. Now, this is special stain, which is uh, John Silver, showing the classical mesangial, uh, sorry, uh, focal segmental sclerosis in one of the sacra. So we showed the membrane of proliferative before here, and uh, the fact that there are no immune complex. And this is focal glomerulus clues. Okay. And now, I, I brought this one because uh, in the recently published uh, reports, I didn't find any criticization for the publication. Unfortunately, uh, uh, this was the first time for me to read that one. Baker and Quarters, 1987, they described many of these patients uh, as having mesangial expansion, reduplication of this membrane, and they said picture is compatible with membrane of peripheral glomerulopathies. And they came with the conclusion at the end that the most common glomerular pathology in those people who are sickle with nephropathy, the most common is membrane of prolactin. Okay? 
I object, of course. And uh, this is the case, uh, one of the cases they described. I think it's very really clear here that there's mesangial ex expansion and a lot of mesangial cells there. Not very clear the thickening of the glomerulus membrane, but by a special stain, which is this one, the John Silver, I think the doubling of the base membrane is clear here. The uh, splitting of base membrane again is present in many of the glomerular capillaries. So there is mesangial expansion with uh, proliferation of mesangial cells, and there is also market thickening of the glomerular base membrane with uh, split. And so, definitely, the diagnosis here is the membrane proliferation, and they found seven out of twelve. But what is seven out of twelve? The number is not that impressive. We reported 200 or something. One of our reports was 527. And I'll tell you what is our conclusion. So these authors, they think that uh, uh, focal segmental, yes, but membrane filters is the most common lesion in adults. No. Now I object, and I'm sure uh, many of you gentlemen and ladies, or ladies and gentlemen, or whatever you like, uh, they agree with me. Our experience during the last 40 years with dealing thousands of sickles with kidney disease, that the most common in the children is the membrane of proliferation. And the most common in adults is the focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, with few of them showing membrane as glomerulus. Chronic kidney disease. Thomas, 1988, and his colleagues were the first to point out the contribution of renal disease and mortality in all the sickle anemia patients. They found chronic renal failure contributing to death in 18% of patients over the age of 20, and at autopsy, those who died, they found shrunking kidney. So, sickles can develop chronic kidney disease, of course. Now, Sharp, in uh, the, his paper in 2014, he stated that chronic renal disease is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in aging sickle cell patients. And his definition of aging, uh, I hope that you don't get upset, uh, because he defined aging as more than 40, believe it or not. So what about one like me, 69? Uh, I should be dead. But anyhow, <laughs> we said aging sickle cell patient, about 40. 25% of 25% has chronic kidney disease, believe it or not. Which accounts for half of the risk. And this shows us the magnitude of the problem. Once they develop chronic kidney disease and they are sickler, mortality is high, is very high. Half of the deaths in sickle cell with kidney disease is because of chronic uh, failure or chronic kidney disease or failure. And Nelson and his colleagues, in addition to Ataga also, in 2014 and 2016, the five year survival following diagnosis of renal failure is variable approximately, look at this, only 55%. Only 55%. They will live five years. Now, that is a study of Sklar, and he uh, correlated the renal disease uh, or chronic kidney disease with and, uh, uh, age. Age is less than 10 and more than 40. As you can see, more you progress with age, the renal insufficiency uh, prevalence is more. And this is expected, of course. Yeah, I, in my opinion, it doesn't need uh, publication and the paper. It's very logical. You have someone who is having glomerulopathy and tubular abnormality and distinction of the glomeruli with sickle cells and papillary necrosis and kidney infection. Second, of course, uh, sometimes I, I wonder uh, of some publication. Why do they do it? What is the point? I don't know. Maybe you give me an explanation of that. Uh, I'm not criticizing, by the way. I'm just astonished. 
Now, post 1995, a prospective 25 year longitudinal study, it's a big number 725 patients with sickle cell anemia and 209 with SC. He found renal failure, he called it renal failure, nowadays we call it chronic kidney disease. He found renal failure in 4.2% of sickle cell anemia, not too much. And in sickle cell uh, C and sickle cell D, 2.4%. The risk of mortality in those people was uh, uh, parallel to the uh, duration of study. It was much higher in the sickle cell disease patient uh, than in those without chronic kidney disease. Similar results have been uh, discussed in the report by Abbott and uh, uh, Eurunia in 2016. Uh, he got uh, the, the last one, which is Eurunia in 2016. He got also a uh, prevalent or percentage of sickle cell anemia of chronic kidney disease of 5.1. So, no much difference. And here's the relation between the cumulative probability of survival uh, from the age of 10 years till 70 against the age. The uh, blue line indicates the secular without kidney failure. The dark line, which is straight, uh, not dotted, shows the chronic kidney disease with sickle. And I think it's very clear here that the cumulative probability, survival probability, or probability of survival much, much, much less and worse than those people with the out uh, renal failure, sickle without renal failure. Then there are more studies with more uh, patients, a bigger number, and they reach the uh, same conclusion that those people who live longer, they are more liable to develop chronic disease, and the mortality in secular will increase up to 38% once they develop chronic kidney disease. Why they develop chronic kidney disease? That's expected. They have chronic glomerular congestion and they have increased transcapillary pressure because of the chronic glomerular congestion. There is expansion of the mesangial matrix, there's mesangial proliferation, there's glomerular sclerosis. So, and then add to that the drugs which they receive, non-steroidal and other antibiotics may be installed. That one of the studies which was early by Clark showing the marked congestion of the glomerular capillaries with the sickle cell and areas of glomerular uh, focal glomerular sclerosis and again the position of hemosiderin in the renal tubule. What about a few words here about kidney transplantation? The first one who reported natural history of renal artery graft and sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait was Chatterjee in 1998 in the United States of America. He had a total of 45 transplants in 40 patients. 11 were liver related donor and 34 cadaveric. 13 patients had sickle cell disease and 27 had sickle cell trait. Now, look at that. The graft survival at one year was only 82% in live related. Of course, compared to 95% and more in non sickle And it was 62% only in cadaveric recipient compared to 75% in non sickle And the patient survival the reported at one year is 88%. That is to say, you have uh, more than uh, 12 patients or 12 patients to die. Uh, these are not good results, of course. Not encouraging, I mean, to transplant those people. Then, Balban 1987, single center study with about 200 patients, he got similar results. 1990, Spector and his colleagues, they started to accuse the painful crisis which occurred in 12 out of 40 patients in the first year, and uh, uh, they, they thought that it is not the only factor. They said, yes, painful crisis may be because of both occlusion, but there must be other factors. But Montgomery in 1994, 
he stated that it is the increase in the mercury because all of us know that after transplantation, their hemoglobin rises because now the kidney function is restored. So the hemoglobin and the hematocrit rises. Unfortunately, once hemoglobin rises above level of nine or so in those people, then they get a vasoclusive crisis. Why is that? Because with more hemoglobin, blood viscosity is more. And then they get crisis. And that's why we tend to keep the hemoglobin in those people who are sicklers and sickler people around the level of nine and not exceeding 10. If you exceed that, you get crisis. A very famous question, why don't transfuse the sickler's blood even with the hemoglobin nine, but uh, while uh, you insist to uh, monthly transfuse the thalassemia patient with hemoglobin even above that? Because thalassemia patients, they don't get plus crisis. But those people who are sickler, if you elevate the hemoglobin above 9, up to level of 10, then you increase the blood viscosity. And you get more crisis. Once they get crisis, then hemolysis. And the hemoglobin even drops to levels below the original. So what is the point? So we give blood transfusion only when hemoglobin is very low or whenever there is severe hemolysis or sequestration crisis, for example. Or sometimes we need to do exchange transfusion and we give big amount of blood, but we remove on the other side uh, equal amounts like that. So anyhow, the conclusion here from these old studies that those people, uh, I mean the sickle cell disease, once you transfer, uh, transplant them, the outcome is not as good as the non sickle And the uh, survival is not also as good as sickle whether it is allograft survival or patient survival. Now we come to more recent uh, uh, publications here in the uh, Journal of Transplantation, Nephrology Trans Transplantation and uh, uh, Clinical uh, Transplant Journal in uh, uh, years 2012-2015. Uh, they came with another theory. Uh, these investigators they found that crisis, yes, may play a role, but they uh, suggest that it is a monoclonal antibody which is given to those patients, as the therapy is responsible for the uh, aggravation of the uh, or the production of more frequent crisis. Of course, uh, our colleagues, my colleagues here in that meeting, may uh, enlighten us about uh, this fact or this assumption. And that's why they suggested that the anti-lymphocyte preparation uh, better to be avoided. Since they induce cytokine relief and the cytokine will enhance sickling and the sickling will lead to vasoclusion, vasoclusion may lead to graft loss. So we have now two explanations. Explanation number one, that they get more frequent vasoclusion because the hemoglobin and the hematocrit value are higher than before, blood viscosity increases, sickling will occur, and destruction of the allogen with time. Explanation number two, that's accusing the drugs. They say the monoclonal antibody and anti-lymphocyte preparation they uh, induce cytokine relief, and cytokine relief induces sickling and damaging endothelium, and so the advice don't to give. Uh, of course, uh, you can uh, combine both theories together and come with some conclusion. Finally, because uh, I think uh, you may get bored, uh, very few words about renal medullary carcinoma. Uh, it is a known complication of so rare. And here I will just uh, copy and paste the uh, uh, publication by Alvarez in the Pediatric Blood Cancer 2015 because I found that this uh, uh, summarizes most of the other papers and it's more conclusive. It was a systematic literature review. They reported new renal medullary carcinoma, and we got a total number of 217. 80% of those had sickle cell trait. 
pay attention here. It is not sickle cell anemia, sickle cell trait. And 8% of the 217 had sickle cell disease. 50% of the 217 were children. Males, again, were more likely to get the medullary cell carcinoma. Uh, what are the symptoms uh, that were uh, documented? Isolated hematuria, or in combination with abdominal or flank pain, it was the presenting, were the presenting signs and symptoms in 66% of cases. The mortality is 95%, unfortunately. So, what is the message? Also, the risk here appears low, but still, any patient of sickle cell trait, you have to warn him against the possibility of renal uh, uh, medullary carcinoma. How? Tell him what if he gets a hematuria and or fl flank pain at any time, it's better to report to hospital. Uh, he will not lose anything and we will screen him by ultrasound or whatever to make sure that he doesn't have uh, that tumor because the mortality is very high. To summarize and to conclude, uh, sorry, I'll bring this down. This is a column, is the renal manifestation, causes comments. Urinary concentration defect. The cause is repeated infarction and renal papillary necrosis and tubular abnormality. It progresses with age. Acidification defect. Defects in the distal convolutibule with high ion excretion. And uh, there is inability to lower the urine pH below 5.3 even by the ammonium uh, chlorides. There is impaired potassium excretion. Why is that? The ischemic injury of the collecting duct. That's why those people, yes, they, they, they have incomplete distal, complete, uh, distal tubular acidosis, but not as shit as hypokalemia like the distal, uh, distal uh, renal tubular acidosis. They are liable even to hyperkalemia because of impaired potassium excretion as a result of the ischemic injury of the collecting duct. The impaired urate clearance with age, ischemic injury of the distal tubule, it progresses with age. Hyperphosphatemia, use gomer fetishary, renal blood flow, etc., etc., with maximal tubular absorption of phosphate, it doesn't indicate renal failure. And it's associated with equal, also uh, enhanced sodium reabsorption. Increased gonorrhea fetation rate to about 50%. That is because of compensatory hypersecretion of the vasodilators, mainly the prostaglandin. And uh, as I said before, the enhanced excretion of the vasoconstrictor prostaglandin. Both glomerulonephritis rate and renal blood flow will be normalized, no more increase with adolescents and young and adults, and then with age. Then there will be later on decreased renal blood flow with progressive age. What is the cause? Congestion of the capillary loops with sickle cell and deposition of hemosiderin and the tubules as well as the glomeruli with the uh, release of inflammatory vasoactive substances like cytokines and acid. Renal papillary necrosis, it is occlusion of the vasa recta and occlusion of the medullary vessel. The incidence is 30 to 40%. Lower risk with increased concentration of fetal hemoglobin or hemoglobin A2 like in patients with sickle thalassemia. Hematuria, medullary vascular occlusion, rarely renal medullary carcinoma, so don't forget this complication, also rare, but it's still present. Hematuria is painless usually and self-limiting. 
80 to 90 percent is unilateral. But however, as I said before, it may be cross hematuria, sometimes requiring even blood transfusion. Glomerular abnormalities and proteinuria. Again, the cause is, uh, let me bring this up here, yeah. yeah. A glomerular abnormalities and proteinuria, it is glomerular hyperfiltration. And also remember the iron overload and iron deposition in tubules and the glomerular. The most common focal segmental glomerular sclerosis in adults, membrane fluorescence, glomerular enthritis in children. Remember that no immune deposition. And if massive proteinuria, you suspect the renal venison, but also no, not common. It is rare. Acute renal failure, volume depletion is the most important. Next to it is severe sepsis, and number three will be rhabdomyolysis. Chronic renal disease, of course, is the result of all what I mentioned before. The incidence in some publication is 3.4, others 4.2, up to 18%. And mortality is high, as I explained, if the uh, sickle cell is associated with chronic kidney disease. Now, Proteinuria, if more than one gram. Non-nephrotic proteinuria biopsy, important to rule out immune glomerulopsy because I said it may be associated with some autoimmune disease. If it is nephrotic, again biopsy, look for the inner vein uh, thrombosis and uh, look for any immune process going on other than sick. Uh, the treatment, of course, uh, if it is non-immune, I mean, if it's only due to sickle, angiotensin converting enzyme or angiotensin receptor block. But be careful of hyperkalemia. Gross hematuria, rule out other coagulopathies. Rule out other nephropathies like stones or uh, tumors or uh, AV malformation, etc. Then you may localize the source of bleeding, and I think that is now available by the uh, interventional urology and interventional even radiology. And look for papillary nephros acute, and don't forget the medullary carcinoma. If it is mild, Good hydration, alkalinization, etc. Severe, then you may give the epsilon amino caproic acid, and sometimes you may go for local embolization if it is endangering life. We have one patient only who had nephrectomy uh, over the last 10 years. Acute renal failure, hypovolemia is the most common, sepsis next, nephrotoxic drug are important, rhabdomyolysis, not, don't forget. But also remember the obstructive nephropathy and the uh, 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 other uh, uh, factors like renal papillary necrosis and rarely, of course, hypertrophic syndrome. We correct the hypovolemia, we treat sepsis, we avoid nephrotoxic drug. Rhabdomyolysis sometimes you may, uh, need to uh, dialyze the patient. Obstruction, alkalinization of urine and pushing fluid, usually it will help. Uh, uh, renal papillary necrosis, again, fluids uh, and uh, alkalinization of urine. For end stage renal disease, of course, once they develop end stage renal disease, then you know how to treat end stage renal disease. No need to spend too much time. And I am sure that you get already bored. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience uh, for this uh, long lecture. And I uh, hope that if you have any comments or questions, uh, I am all yours. Thank and, you very much, Professor Ibrahim. You. Really very wonderful. And uh, one of the, uh, the best presentation because it is very, you, you follow the easiest pathway, so it is very clear for all of us. Uh, as I, I said in the beginning, only we have a case, only one case uh, among our transplant series uh, that she had sickle cell disease. It was a very 
a challenging case because when we reviewed the literature, we just find patient graft survival. Yes, graft survival in transplant is lower than non-secular, but if we compare it to the dialysis patient, it is significantly better. But how to prepare this case for transplantation? We would like to reduce hemoglobin S. And at the time, we, did, we didn't do exchange transfusion, total exchange transfusion. We just reduced the level of hemoglobin S by, uh, uh, by giving frequent blood transfusion at three dialysis session, and then we repeated cross-match to reduce hemoglobin S below 30%. And I think one of the problem is the, for seculars, uh, there is either splenectomy in the early infant uh, childhood because of uh, crisis or splenectomy uh, after that. How to do with, the, with this infection, Dr. Ibrahim? Infection of what, Dr. Hussein? Uh, related to hyposplenism in these cases. Is uh, it a yeah. problem in, the, in the your experience or? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, we assume that it is inca encapsulated organism, as you know. Uh, so we first uh, we give prophylaxis by immunization against pneumococcal uh, and against uh, Haemophilus influenza uh, yearly and uh, every three or five years. And uh, also we give against Neisseria gonorrhea. Uh, sorry, Neisseria meningitis. Uh, but uh, as uh, I'm sure you know that once they develop infection, we know, for example, if they come with chest infection, the most common organism is pneumococci. If they come with bone infection or semolitis, so we treat it as pseudomonas uh, because that is uh, the, uh, from our experience, most common. Uh, doesn't mean that we don't do cultures. No, we do cultures, but we start empirically. If chest, <clears throat> treat pneumo. If born osteomyelitis, then we treat him as pseudomonas. And most of the time, the culture will prove that we are right. But uh, regarding infection, uh, Dr. Hussein, uh, in uh, the literature, and I'm sure you are aware of that. And I am very happy that uh, your protocol of exchange, you said exchange transfusion before transplantation. Is that what you said? We, we, we transfused the patient by six units. It was not total exchange transfusion. This is what we, do, we did by giving blood transfusion two units in each dialysis session uh, to reduce hemoglobin S to the nadir, 30%, less than 30%. And, and I the, think... Uh, yeah, the outcome. Uh, the outcome was very... Yeah, the vergine graft and the patient survival, the patient lived for 11 years with successful transplant and even she was married and had the nice girl. But uh, because uh, we, we used the hydroxy, uh, we, we used the drug to reduce hemoglobin S, hydroxyurea to reduce uh, and to shift hemoglobin toward the hemoglobin F. Despite that, the, this patient experienced a lot of crises, hemolytic, uh, pneumonic, pneumonic uh, thrombotic, and uh, bone crisis for uh, humoral and uh, femoral necrosis. But she, at the end, she was fighter uh, that she lived for more than 11 years and had a nice girl. Oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic. I think you, uh, yes. Yeah. I, I'd because like to, uh, yes. But, what I found in literature, I'm sure you are aware of that, that many of uh, those uh, uh, authors, <clears throat> they are uh, not having a good impression about transplantation of sickle. I don't know whether this is a point of controversy or not, but I'll give you Nath, for example, in the year 2012, and uh, Scheinman, in, uh, who published in the Clinical Practice Methodology, and the Rahman, uh, again, clinical transplant 2009, Koshat, and uh, RCP, all of them, they come with the conclusion that the long term and, and how it comes in such patients is unclear. I don't know what they mean by unclear. And it has not been supported by large prospective studies. Maybe, uh, the, I mean, what you, you said, uh, can I ask how many seculars, Professor? Hussein? In our, in our experience, it's one case, yeah. only one case. Yeah, it is not common. Among, uh, among 3,200 cases, only one case. Yeah. yeah. But it was very challenging to us. 
it is it is challenge dr riyad saeed was was start the discussion with professor riyad saeed okay dr ibrahim بصراحه uh, it is one of the best talks that i really listened on this topic congratulations thank and thank you very much really for this elegant very comprehensive talk Thank I you. have a couple of comments and questions for you yes. regarding the uh, I totally agree about what you showed initially about the histopathology with the large extremely large glomeruli that you have on your biopsies that's exactly what you quoted on you see it in cyanotic heart disease and in some congenital things and also we do see this in polycythemia rubra vera when we have the hyperviscosity syndrome as you alluded to so that's part of the large glomerular pathology mega glomerulopathy that was they call it mega glomerulopathy that's one thing concerning the hematuria it was really explained elegantly and again we encountered several cases of hematuria in trait patients and mostly on the left side as you really quoted and you mentioned without knowing why it happened i was really impressed with what you mentioned one case of your series required nephrectomy it has been yeah. reported in the literature that auto transplantation you can do nephrectomy and auto transplantation of the same kidney usually at a lower position put it in the like kidney transplant you move it from its place you put it like kidney transplant and it will work and it can really clear the hematuria i don't know what's your comment about this yeah exactly thank you very much dr yab uh, i totally agree with you about the uh, glomerular congestion with the rvcs which is not peculiar not unique for the sickle only but can be seen with other cases and myself i have seen uh, this with polycythemia as you mentioned correctly and with a uh, condition associated with cyber viscosity but why we did nephrectomy one patient actually it was very frustrating and he came with severe hematuria after acute papillary necrosis and then uh, failed to stop even with the uh, epsilon amino caprotic acid and then because we don't know the patient before he just came to us uh, unfortunately we did nephrectomy unfortunately again he died uh, because of hypovolemic shock this was long time ago but when when we uh, uh, do, did uh, examine the kidney which was removed uh, we were surprised to discover the renal medullary carcinoma okay so mm -hmm. th this was the first case i have seen the renal medullary carcinoma so I, of course i am very sorry that he died but he would have died anyhow because the lungs also having metastasis here and there uh, uh, massive hematuria sometimes very difficult to treat uh, okay. uh, if you permit me about uh, the second the last comment you mentioned yeah. hype uh, the patient with acidemia and they don't usually develop hypokalemia as the normal renal tubular acidosis this is to me really it's a type 4 renal tubular acidosis that we encounter with like patient with lupus like some uh, other patient when they have hypotassium hyperemic and it's strictly because chronic tubular interstitial disease that's really notorious that such patients they will develop chronic tubular interstitial disease like diabetic patient when they have type 4 renal tubular acidosis that their potassium is on the high side not on the low side yeah exactly i agree with you and it is very difficult to uh, uh, to categorize the type of renal tubular acidosis in those people because on one side they have incomplete distal renal tubular acidosis yes. which tends to cause hypokalemia but on the other side they have uh, severe interstitial nephritis also because of the use of different drugs and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory etc and because of the effect of cytokines on the renal tubules and because of different mechanisms which tend to impair the function as i explained before so is it a mixture of uh, incomplete type 1 in addition to type 4 because also they prove that they are having some form of hypoaldosteronism. So that's, that's exactly, yeah, yeah, that's exactly, yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this may explain why those people, they are not hypokalemic. Actually, they may have hyperkalemia. We should avoid drugs correctly, as you mentioned, Dr. Riyadh. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much again. Yes. Excuse me, Dr. Riyad and Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, regarding your experience, be, because glomerulopathy may be uh, related to uh, HCV, uh, related to excessive blood transfusion or others. So we may find uh, immune deposition not related to cycling, but to uh, the associated infection. What is your opinion regarding this yeah. point? Uh, uh, you, you are absolutely right. That's a good point. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Hussein, the rule is it is uh, not associated with immune deposition. This is yes. the rule. But because of repeated infections, which may uh, start to stimulate the uh, cytokines and uh, Complement the complement cascade, etc., etc., it may turn at some extent to have some type of immune deposition. The only clue is a biopsy. We do a biopsy. Yeah, and for our patients, we have thousands here. For our patient, anyone who comes with renal abnormality, we biopsy him. Why, why, why do you biopsy for these patients without proteinuria? No, I mean proteinuria. I'm talking about only proteinuria. We don't biopsy other sickles uh, with the hematuria or papillary necrosis, etc. But if they have proteinuria, whether nephrotic or non nephrotic, we biopsy. This is our protocol. And then the biopsy, electron microscopy is extremely important and immunofluorescence. Once they develop uh, the feature of immune deposition as a result of repeated sepsis and activation of complex cascade, then they may re respond to steroid. But otherwise, the usual from our practice that maybe more than 90% of them, they don't have uh, any form of immune deposition at all unless it is associated with other diseases like systemic lupus, rheumatoid, or whatever. Then the treatment management will be different, uh, as you know. Thank you very much. Professor Al Ghamdi uh, already published a case of sickle cell uh, in the experimental uh, transplantation. I would like to hear from him uh, his experience regarding this point. Dr. Al Ghamdi. Assalamu alaikum. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Well, uh, well yeah. actually, uh, as uh, uh, thank you, Professor Ibrahim, for this really uh, enlightening uh, presentation. Thank and you. I must say that we in Saudi Arabia, for example, that we see lots of sicklers, especially in the eastern Saudi Arabia, where uh, Professor Ibrahim is really uh, uh, working. And uh, we see it actually in the western province from area coming from Tehama area or the southern part of Saudi Arabia. And uh, regarding uh, transplantation, we had uh, two experiences with transplantation. One of them, which has, I have uh, reported previously, which is transplantation of sickle cell trait to sickle cell trait uh, uh, patients with uh, interstitial disease. And actually, the, uh, 15 years after transplantation, we report that 2007, but uh, still following. And after the, all this period, is still doing very well with no problem. We transplanted another patient who was really very, very interesting um, uh, patient who actually had nephrotic range proteinuria. He's a sickler, has been all the time, was around six, he had to see negative, everything is negative. And when we biopsied him, he was IgA. And he was steroid responsive, IgA nephropathy. And uh, after, unfortunately, 10 years later, he developed intestinal disease and he was transplanted. And he stayed transplanted, doing well despite that frequent blood transfusions and uh, very low hemoglobin, around six all the time. But unfortunately, he died with a road traffic accident four years later. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Saeed, uh, regarding yes. the preparation for transplantation, did you adopt exchange transfusion total or uh, no? What, what do you do? No. Well, actually, just did like uh, any transplantation. We just transplanted him, and he was excellent graft function after the... the and the hemoglobin S before transplant, percentage of hemoglobin We had, I'm not sure, it's not in the top of my mind right now, but yeah. uh, what he had, he had a frequent blood transfusion after that. And uh, despite that, he has an hydroxyurea, uh, yes. a good dose around one gram daily, despite that, he's still requiring frequent blood transfusion. And despite those transfusion, his, uh, he never developed rejection. And he remained for four years doing quite well until he died or succumbed to a traffic accident. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Saeed, for your experience. Uh, Professor Nasser Abhamid. Professor Yasser. Alaikum. Alaikum. Thank you, Professor Ibrahim, for this highly elegant and informative detailed talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, my question that you said that we are to use in uh, papillary necrosis IV fluids, IV distal water. I am right for this? Uh, yeah, uh, distal yeah, water. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We yeah, use we distal water. That's what. This is our recommendation uh, for treating of patients with severe hematuria or uh, hematuria with papillary necrosis to the infuse ah. distal water. Can can we use any other type of fluids, or we are yeah, you to? Can use, you can use a hypotonic saline, for example. Uh, the oh, idea oh, is to push fluid push and fluid? not to give sodium. Push fluid because yes. we need to ah. flush. We don't need the blood clots to form. And this so is, we this give is the point. It. Yeah. Yes. This is the point I want to explain. We are to use fluids and hypotonic fluids, especially. Uh, yeah, especially case. hypotonic. Yes. Hypotonic. Flushing. The idea is flushing. We don't need a reabsorption of sodium because sodium reabsorption is already enhanced. That's why oh. we don't get sodium. We need to mechanical removal of any blood clots. So this daughter can do the job with sodium bicarbonate. Thank you, Thank you again. It yeah. seems that Professor Riyad wants to add uh, something here. Yes, sure. Professor Riyad. Hey, Do you like to add? Uh, because I think, you know, I think it's really uh, the only thing I'll say it's a great talk, and I appreciate really also the talk of Dr. the comment of Dr. Saeed El Ghamdi about their transplantation. Unfortunately, we did not really have an experience with transplant with secular here in our area because we don't see much. Okay, most of them usually used to come to us from Bahrain and again from Eastern Saudi Arabia. But uh, for transplantation, I don't have really such experience. Now, concerning the crisis, I agree, just hypotonic fluids and just force diuresis, force diuresis, flushing the system, because sometimes they will come really with renal colic. Now, the main thing, infection, you asked about infection, yes. and Dr. Ibrahim elegantly commented about encapsulated, encapsulated like name, cocktail and vaccination. But such patients also, they are protected against malaria. Oh. What's your comment, Dr. Ibrahim? Yeah, the malaria uh, requires certain type of hemoglobin. The hemoglobin should be normal. And the presence of hemoglobin S, S in particular, not ST, uh, somehow it uh, fights or is not a suitable medium for malaria because I, I think malaria parasite uh, recognizes the normal and abnormal hemoglobin. Malaria parasite knows that if she infest, infested a blood cell with abnormal hemoglobin, this uh, blood cell will be broken soon or getting sickled, for example. And I think with time, with time, the, uh, uh, there will be some uh, bad or relation between. But uh, the, 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 the other explanation, which is written in book, that the malaria parasite has the ability to recognize the composition of the beta and alpha chain of globin, of the hemoglobin pain. And when she find that, in the beta globin chain, that there is substitution of valine with glutamine, it considers it as a hostile, as a hostile medium. So it doesn't go inside. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brian. Dr. Ahmed Suleh, um, I missed Ahmed Suleh uh, so much. Uh, good opportunity to have him with us in this uh, webinar. Ahmed. Thank you so much, Prof. Hussain, Prof. Prof. Brahim. Thank you so much. I really enjoy this lovely, lovely presentation from Prof. Brahim. Um, uh, Prof. Brahim, just a quick question, please, if you don't mind. I wish we have more time to talk about um, dialysis in sickle patients. Um, I understand it's mainly tailored uh, between every patient, but from your experience, um, you know, about people with frequent vasoclusive crises who end up having dialysis, um, from your experience, what do you prefer, like peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis? Yeah, this is a good question because uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't want to compare between hemo and peritoneal dialysis because some people may get upset. But from our experience, uh, peritoneal dialysis is more physiologic. There is no dealing with blood. The patient doesn't get hypotension during the dialysis. There is no need to create some AV fistulas, etc. The uh, blood-borne infections, of course, are out completely. So we are avoiding the uh, factors which may precipitate sickling again. 
there is no hypoxia like what happened in hemodialysis. Some of them they develop low oxygen. Building. There is no hypotension again, and there is no usually no blood infection, no blood borne infection. It is more physiologic and can be easily done even at home. So, <laughs> if you ask about my own experience and Professor Al Huish will tell you sure it is a personal death, no doubt. Thank you, thank you so much, Prof. Thank you also. Mm -hmm. Is Tamil, uh, I cannot hear you, Dr. Hussein. Dr. Hussein, I cannot hear you, you muted it. Dr. Tamir? Okay, now I hear you. Yes. Tamir. Tamir. Tamir Salamun. Okay, Dr. Hani Mansour. Hani? Uh, yes, Hello? Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, Prof. Hussein, and thank you very much, Prof. Ibrahim, for this elegant, comprehensive talk, uh, which will be considered uh, a very useful reference for sickle cell uh, and the kidney. I have a small question, if you allow me, about the role of nitric oxide and the pathogenesis of sickle cell uh, disease in, in the kidney, and if uh, there are any uh, implications for uh, this hypothesis. <laughs> yeah, this is a difficult question, let's go ahead. But uh, let me uh, give you a hint. Uh, what is nitric oxide first? Nitric oxide is a gas. And this gas is produced by the endothelial cells of the blood vessel. And the half-life of the nitric oxide is second, few seconds. That is to say it has to be continuously produced. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. We all know that. So the endothelial cells, under normal conditions, they produce nitric oxide from glutamine and the, under the effect of certain coenzymes, release it into circulation. And how it works, it activates cyclic AMP, and cyclic AMP, when it is activated, it leads to a reduction of the calcium content of the smooth muscle, so the smooth muscle will get relaxed. Once you get relaxation of smooth muscle, including the muscles of the blood vessel, you get vasodilatation. That is the action of nitric oxide. So what is nitric oxide? It is a gas produced by what? <coughs> Endothelial cells. What is the action? It activates the cyclic MP, removing calcium from the smooth muscle and the muscles around the vessel, leading to dilatation and the relaxation, and hence vasodilatation. What happened in sacral? Now, before that, they think that uh, nitric oxide is increased in sacral, that's why they get vasodilatation and increased glomerulation. This is nonsense. Nowadays, after working hard, it is the opposite. Because during cycling process and the breakdown of the RBCs, the hemoglobin is released in circulation. This hemoglobin, unfortunately, has the power to consume nitric oxide. It consumes, it eats nitric oxide, it combines nitric oxide. So what happens actually is drop of the level of nitric oxide in the circulation. Previously, they said nitric oxide is high because they examined the nitric oxide in the hemoglobin, inside the hemoglobin, which was wrong. We should have examined the nitric oxide in the circulation because it is the nitric oxide in the circulation which activates cyclic MB leading to vasodilatation. So in conclusion, conclusion, nitric oxide, which is a gas produced from endothelial cells, activates in cyclic MP, leading to loss of calcium from the cells, especially the source muscle, leading to relaxation, but it is eaten up by the hemoglobin, which is released in circulation. So the level of nitric oxide in sickle cell anemia patient during the attack of uh, hemolysis drops, does not increase. And it has no role at all in vasodilatation during the sick process. Uh, Dr. Tamir. Dr. Tamir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brahim, for your elegant promoted presentation. As usual, I really enjoyed it. Uh, coming back to the kidney transplantation uh, with those yeah. patients with sickle cell disease, Dr. Hassan yeah. talked already about the exchange of therapy pre transplantation. For you, Dr. Ibrahim, if any precautions we can consider or tackle post transplantation, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tamir. 
now we can divide the question into two. I think the professor said he helped me in that because more he is more expert of transplantation. But I have to say, from the few cases we have seen together, Dr. Cameron and Dr. Hani, that precautions before and precautions after. Precaution before is still we, with all due respect to Professor Hussein, we leave that uh, uh, giving those people the opportunity of exchange blood transfusion before transplantation may improve the uh, chance for and uh, may improve the graft survival itself. And uh, on the other hand, uh, making sure that they don't have an infection before sending him to transplantation like any other, because those people sometimes they have viral illness. After transplantation, unfortunately, when they get infection, they get infection with virus. And I think uh, Professor has said, uh, not, not about sickle, I'm talking in general. What is the most common infection which you encounter in the post transplant? What we have is cytomegalovirus because in cytomegalovirus yeah. we treat cytomegalovirus. I, 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 I just want to add a point before transplantation when we think of exchange transfusion or giving blood transfusion to reduce hemoglobin S because the risk of surgery. Surgery may lead to sickling if hemoglobin S is within the high percentage. This is why I would like to give the patient hemoglobin A in the blood, from blood trans, transfusion to reduce the chance of sickling because of the stress of surgery. And we uh, discuss with the both surgeon and a test and all the person who are taking of the patients to optimize the environment to avoid any hypo because hypovolemia, hypotension, hypoxemia can lead to sickling crisis in the short period after transplantation. The major problem is after having a good graft, as Professor Ibrahim mentioned, the graft produces erythropoietin that increases the native hemoglobin, which is hemoglobin S. This, this will increase the risk of crises in all aspects, hemolytic, bone, and the pneumonic crisis. Sometimes it's very difficult to discriminate between pulmonary embolism and the pneumonic uh, uh, crisis. So this is a big dilemma. So the, uh, transplanting a sickle cell disease uh, really needs uh, an expert and needs system, very strong system to follow up the patient. We can give a uh, nevococcal vaccine or to give a small dose of antibiotic after transplantation because of bac bacterial infection as Professor Ibrahim mentioned. Um, uh, I think this is the problem of uh, transplant sickle uh, cell disease. But uh, Professor Hussein, you think that uh, we can say that it is not contraindication for transplantation? Because they compare, Dr. Ibrahim, compare survival after transplantation by survival on dialysis. Really, the journey of hemodialysis is very difficult. The patient suffers from pains, suffers from hemodynamic instability and hypotension, and uh, hemodialysis is a quiet uh, suffering for patients and for those who are taking of the patient. Uh, and um, uh, I agree about your point that Britain dialysis may even be better for these patients with some hemodynamic abnormality or their tendency for hypotension. I think because yes. of the time, yes. we'll go rapidly to Dr. Saeed Khamis and then Dr. Saeed. Dr. Yasser Al Mullah. Dr. Yasser. Many thanks for the great talk. I just have one question. Uh, do you accept donation from a patient with sickle cell trait? Yes or no? It is a difficult situation. I think it is no, better. It is, I think for, for my mind and my aspects to uh, refuse this donor because if we accept sickle cell trait donor and then sickling crisis occurs because of stress of surgery, this will be a great problem. And I think Professor Al Ghamdi mentioned this in his case. I'm not sure if Professor Al Ghamdi with us to uh, just to, uh, unfortunately he left the, the webinar. Yes. So in one word, no, Dr. Yasser. Uh, currently I don't agree about trait uh, person to donate a kidney. 
I'm not sure if you uh, have another uh, opposite opinion or not. Riyasir? Riyasir al So I, I remember this very well because I used to work in Muscat, sometimes for Oman, where they have a lot of sickle cell patients. And sadly, they don't have a disease donor program there. So it's usually a live donation. And there was a patient that the family were insisting that they want to donate to the brother and that the, the donor himself was a trade. And we did all the workup and the workup all was negative. And we also ended up doing a kidney biopsy, which was completely normal. And we tried our best to convince the patient or let's say the donor that he should not donate, but he was insisting on that. And sadly, because we refused, they traveled to another country where they do like illegal or let's say commercial transplant and both the donor and the recipient sadly died, but I'm not sure why did they die. That's why I'm very much interested in that question, but I fully agree with your answer. Thank you. The case, I, I want to add a point, the case that we have here uh, from our experience, the, the, the pharmacist uh, uh, that uh, had uh, sickle cell disease, homozygous, and I think the, the, uh, the donor was her mother. And I think she, she had a trait so we did the uh, uh, donation from a trade at that time. But if uh, we are today, then um, uh, I think so much before accepting to take a kidney from a person who is trade because this put him in uh, serious consequences if sickle cell disease occurred. Um, so in your single case, the donor was the donor a was a trade. A trade, right. yes. Oh, yes. God. That, that's excellent. And was it written as a case report, by the way? Excuse me. Was it written as a case report? Is it published? It is not published. It was presented in one of the conference, but was not published in journals. Excellent. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Dr. Donia? Dr. Dr. Donia? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Professor Ibrahim, for this. Uh, 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 elegant talk as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I, uh, I, I just, uh, uh, I will not, not add uh, a lot in uh, uh, in medicine, but I'd like to express my happiness uh, to listen to Professor Ibrahim. He is a great professor, and I enjoyed working uh, besides him uh, for a short period, and uh, I was really impressed by his. Uh, marvelous uh, personality and uh, 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 I, I was impressed by his uh, uh, by him as a great man and a great scientist and a, a great doctor and uh, Professor Hassan I congratulate you because you are now like uh, FC Barcelona <laughs> and uh, you, you, you now uh, got Messi with you <laughs> so uh, uh, you, you succeeded to uh, uh, to have uh, uh, one of the best uh, uh, doctors uh, with you in your uh, uh, really impressive and uh, helpful platform. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, agree with I, uh, uh, I just want to say uh, we miss you really here. Uh, although your, uh, your presence was short, but تركتي يعني بصمات كثيرة. يعني لا تتصور مدى اشتياقنا لك يا دكتور احمد. ربنا يكرمك يا دكتور ابراهيم شكرا جدا والله ومبسوط جدا ان انا بشوف حضرتك وبسمع حضرتك. الله يجزيك خير. بتعلم من حضرتك دايما. لا العفو العفو دكتور احمد العفو الله يكرمك. So uh, we reached now two hour and 15 minutes so it's quite exhaustive for Professor Ibrahim. Thank you very much Dr. Ibrahim for Thank this. You. Thank you. Very nice, very simple. Uh, you, up to the point, and I want to uh, add to the Professor Ahmed uh, comment that we learned from B Professor Ibrahim not only information, but uh, you are a real a role model in your attitude, skills, you. and information, and supporting everyone, everyone in the in the hospital and in the university. Thank you very much. Hoping uh, to join us again and again. Thank, Thank you, you and. Uh, and at the end of this presentation, I'd like to thank all the attendees for uh, their participation. And tomorrow morning, inshallah, I'm going to upload the presentation to the YouTube. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.
Close. 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 Close.